All right. What will you sacrifice? I've recently read a book called Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. And as I was reading that book, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome, and as I was reading now where God had sent me to Joshua chapter 5, I realized that if we're going to be that church that is going to be active, like the church used to be. We're going to be that church that is making a difference like the church used to be. We're going to have to deal with a condition that we have. And that condition is post-traumatic slave syndrome. Now, if you haven't heard that term before, that's okay. So we'll talk about it today. If you have heard it, I think it bears repeating. Post-traumatic slave syndrome is based on post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD as we call it. And the book that is written that I will be talking from a little bit today, and you'll hear from in a sense, is Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome by Dr. Joy DeGroote. Now, I will use these terms, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome and Post Traumatic Slave, I'm sorry, Post Traumatic Stress Disorder interchangeably because they are connected. The Slave Syndrome is based on the stress disorder. If you're unfamiliar with post-traumatic stress disorder, basically our working definition is going to be an unhealthy and protracted response to a traumatic experience. An unhealthy and protracted response to a traumatic experience. In other words, something bad happens to you, and even though the event has ended, has passed, Days later, weeks later, months later, even years later, you're still experiencing bad consequences or bad feelings about what happened long ago. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, post-traumatic slave syndrome is similar because it is something that has happened in the past, but it goes all the way back to slavery. It goes all the way back to the trauma of slavery. What trauma? Well, you think about slavery, then you know there was trauma. What trauma? Well, let's think about the whole separate but unequal, separate but unequal facilities. What trauma? Well, let's talk about disenfranchisement. What trauma? Well, let's talk about police brutality. What trauma? That trauma. All that trauma. Now, when you experience that, there are some things that you will go through. There are some things that will um, come up for you over and over again, and we're going to talk about those in a bit. But the first thing I want to do is I want you to look at a small video clip of Dr. DeGruy, and I encourage you to find it, Google it, uh, find it on YouTube. It will, it will open your mind. I was going to say blow your mind, might do that too, but it will open your mind. But we'll go ahead and watch that at this time. This kind of journey I'm going to take you on is going to be one that really gives a perspective on what this trauma was, what it looks like, and clinically, what is post-traumatic stress disorder? What does it look like? Let me give you a little snapshot. We'll get into it in more depth a little later. But post-traumatic stress disorder, if in fact you are diagnosed with that, again, remember, direct or indirect trauma, Here are some of the symptoms. A feeling of foreshortened future. Now, what does that mean? A feeling, well, you're not going to live long. How many of you are running into young people that don't believe they're going to make it past their 20s? Feeling of foreshortened future. Exaggerated startle response. Outbursts of anger. Difficulty falling or staying asleep. Hypervigilance, right? These are symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. This is like DSM stuff, Diagnostic Statistical Manual Mental Disorders. It's in there. And there's a whole listing of all these symptoms. Now, I want to roll it back so you can understand what, I, what the transmission theory is, because I'm going to talk about transmission. So how does a person that's been traumatized by post-traumatic, literally has a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, and can we, if we are logical and we are reasonable people, assume that a fair number of Africans had to have had post-traumatic stress disorder? You think? I'm not talking about us, I'm talking about them. Untreated, though, right? Okay, so now let's do the math. Mom 
who saw dad sold or sister raped has post-traumatic stress disorder. Still mom though, right? Only mom now has outbursts of anger, feeling of foreshortened future, difficulty falling or staying asleep, hypervigilance. That would be mom. Now, Johnny or Mary or Shaquisha does not have, did not have the original trauma. But what are they learning? This is called social learning theory. What am I normalizing? Exaggerated startle response, outbursts of anger. Do, are you following me? So I didn't have to be traumatized. Now, the other thing is, do you think Johnny and Mary got traumatized too? Do you see? So what happens in your environment, you learn from the significant others in your environment. And if they're broken, guess what you're going to be? You're learning from broken people. And you're normalizing that behavior. And I'm telling you, there's some deep stuff there. Yeah. And, and I want to tell you, I'm going to be real with you. If you have a heart that is sensitive to this situation, you pray before you watch the video. And when you're done, you pray. And for real, for real. And, 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 and kind of lock yourself in the door in the house, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, like don't see nobody, you know what I'm saying? We just stay right there in the home, you know? Pray, pray through that thing, pray through it. Come on, sometimes you gotta pray through some things. It's one of those kind of videos. You're going to have to pray through it. But it's, it, it may not taste good, but it's good for you. Because it really opens your mind to what we experience as a people. In fact, since I uh, looked at the video, since I read the book, I began to notice, and maybe you've even noticed some things in your own life as you think about post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, let's, let's look at a few of the, the, the symptoms she said. It's a feeling of foreshortened future. Exaggeration or exa exaggerated startled response. Outbursts of anger. Difficulty falling or staying asleep. Hyper vigilance. And once I read it, I began to kind of be a little more attuned to that kind of thing. So I was watching an event on television last week. And Neil, some of y'all heard of Neil, an Afri African-American singer was singing a song by Pitbull, a rapper of Cuban descent. And it's entitled, The Time of Our Life. And I realized, wait a minute, this is kind of even being expressed in song. And the song went like this. I knew my rent was going to be late about a week ago. I worked myself a lot, but I still can't pay it, though. <laughs> but I just got just enough to get up in this club, have me a good time before my time is up. Hey, let's get it now post-traumatic slave syndrome. Feelings of a foreshortened future. I can't pay the rent anyway, so I might as well. And then he talks about rolling it up. And he's not talking about a sandwich wrap. He talks about tossing it up. And he ain't talking about a salad. I'm just saying. Post-traumatic slave syndrome. And, 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 and I hear you, I hear you like, hey, you know what, that's what these young people listening to. When I was growing up, we didn't have no post-traumatic slave syndrome. I don't know what you're talking about, Pastor. And besides, that song was written by someone of Cuban descent. Neil was just singing the song. Well, might I remind you of Tupac? who said, my every move is a calculated step to bring me closer to a close, I mean, to an early death. Now there's nothing left. My every move is a calculated step to bring me closer to embrace an early death. Now nothing's left. Post-traumatic slave syndrome, even in our music. And then, of course, I hear you saying, yeah, 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 okay. But I was like kind of really listening to all this kind of music in the 70s, you know what I'm saying, like early 70s and stuff, so okay. Stevie Wonder said, had a song called Living in the City. His hair is long, his feet are hard and gritty. He spends his life walking through the streets of New York City. 
He's almost dead from breathing in air pollution. He tried to vote, but to him there's no solution. We're living just enough, just enough for the city. Living just enough, just enough for the city. Post-traumatic slave syndrome. But then you're like, hey, you skipped me. You got those in the 2000s. You did the 90s. And you did the 70s. But I grew up in the 80s and we never had no, we didn't have no problems. Well, might I remind you of Melly Mel? Don't push me because I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to. To lose my head. Uh, huh, huh, huh. It's like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. Post traumatic slave syndrome. Exaggerated, exaggerated, startled response. Hypervigilance. Outbursts of anger. Don't push them. Some of y'all have to tell some of your bosses that. Come on now. You, you, you told a few folks that. Come on. And then you say, yeah, but you know what? I wouldn't even know all that secular stuff. All right, so how about the spirituals? Nobody knows. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. And you look at all and listen to all the spirituals they talk about heaven. Why? Because they ain't planning on being here very long. Post-traumatic slave syndrome. Well, you can listen to the Dr. DeGruz video and we could actually go on more and more points regarding the situation. But the question is, what can we do about it? So for the rest of this sermon, we're going to look at what God did about it. Israel had crossed the Jordan and had entered Canaan. They're en route to go against some warriors, incredible warriors in Jericho. But they could not experience real growth and real progress and real victory with post-traumatic slave syndrome blocking them. So let's go to Joshua chapter 5, and beginning at verse 1, we will read. We'll be in the New Living Translation. Well, I will be reading from the New uh, Living Translation. When all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings who lived along the Mediterranean coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan River so that the people of Israel could cross, They lost heart and were paralyzed with fear because of them. At that time, the Lord said, the Lord told Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise this second generation of Israelites. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the entire male population of Israel at Gebeath Haraloth. Yeah, they're like, Pastor, I have a little more time to read that one. Yeah, got it out though, got it out. Joshua had to circumcise them because all the men who were old enough to fight in battle when they left Egypt had died in the wilderness. Those who left Egypt had all been circumcised, but none of those born after Exodus during the years in the wilderness had been circumcised. The Israelites had traveled in the wilderness for 40 years until all the men were old enough to fight in battle when they left Egypt, when they left Egypt had died, for they had disobeyed the Lord. They did what? And the Lord vowed he would not let them enter into the land he had sworn to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So Joshua circumcised their sons, those who had grown up to take their father's places, for they had not been circumcised on the way to the promised land. After all the males had been circumcised, they rested in the camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, today I have rolled away the shame of your slavery in Egypt. So that place has been called Gilgal to this day. What do we have here? The youth and young adults of Israel have crossed the Jordan and were about to inherit what their parents had talked about but had not seen. And they've got some momentum, but God pauses them. Now, I want to just pause myself for a moment 
And imagine, these are 40-year-old old people and younger about to take Canaan. These are young adults. These are teenagers. But they have a, something that's blocking them. They have the issues of their parents still on their backs. They have the issues of their parents still inside of them. They have the issues of their parents still plaguing them. And so God says, wait, 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 we got to do something about this. The, the, these young adults, these teenagers are about to take Canaan and they got to be ready, but they can't do it. They, they've got the muscle, they've got the brawn, they, they've got the wisdom, but they still got some baggage. They still got post-traumatic slave syndrome. And so we've got to work through that thing. Now, the Bible says, that God said he was going to roll away the reproach of Egypt. In the New Living Translation, it says he's going to roll away the shame, but I believe today we would say he was going to roll away the post-traumatic slave syndrome. Can I give you another symptom of it? When things would get rough for Israel, they would start romanticizing what it was to be in slavery. They would begin to romanticize what it was to live and be in the ghetto. They began to make what was a bad thing, what was an abnormal thing, what was an unhealthy thing, seem like it was something that was swag. And so God had to say, no, 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 we can't go out like that. You can have your swag, but you can't have post-traumatic slave syndrome with your swag. So at least four times, you read in the Bible, e Israel is pining after Egypt. And God's like, no, we can't have that. We can't have you pining after Egypt because that's post-traumatic slave syndrome. And so here's the symptom. You can read it in DSM or, or, or something online. It says, the inability to remember key aspects of the event. The only way you're going to talk about going back to slavery is you are having trouble remembering the event. You forgot something. You don't understand what really happened. I used to teach kids in, um, who had been kicked out of school in Upland. And it's alternative ed for San Bernardino County Schools and and the kids would call each other the N-word all day. And there wasn't but a few of us in the class. And I told a boy one time, I said, man, I don't want to hear you say that anymore. He said, why not? That's what we say. I said, because for too long we've been called that. He said, it ain't the same thing. <laughs> we don't say it with the ER at the end. We got an A. We just, just make it with an A at the end. I told him it's just the same thing. It came from the same source. It connotes and denotes the same problem. And so what I would have him do, every time he said it, boy, this boy would be writing standards. Some of y'all remember standards. And what I did is I, I, listened, I had listened to this tape on Richard Pryor. And Richard Pryor used to say that all the time in his, in his, in his comedy routines. And, and then he went to Africa. And he saw where we come from. And he saw us in charge of everything where he went to. And he said, there's no such thing as that kind of person. And he said, from there on, I'm not even going to say that anymore. And so what I did is I played it and I had a few words from Richard Pryor. I wrote it down. I paused the VHS. See, it shows you what time. Paused the VHS. I wrote down a few more words, paused the VHS till I had his whole script. And that was that boy's standards to help him to realize where we come from. That from where we come from, you don't want to use it. That's post-traumatic slave syndrome. You don't want to use that in referring to one another. 
It's not helpful. It's not insightful. Because if you really realize where the word came from, you wouldn't say it. If you really realize where some of the stuff comes from, you wouldn't do it. So that's why we got to have black history. Black History Month, yes, we're black all year long. But we need to focus at some point. And may this be an inspiration to start it in March, go into March and go into April with it. Someone say, man, go into May and go in June and all the way through the year till you get back to Black History Month again. And we emphasize it again. The inability to remember key aspects of the event. They must have forgot something about slavery to be talking about, let's go back. We had it good in slavery. They needed to scream out like the old Negro spirituals used to do. Before I be a slave and be buried in my grave, I will go home to my Lord and be free. Post-traumatic slave syndrome. God's like, no, we can't have that. So to roll away the reproach, to roll away the post-traumatic slave syndrome, to make sure that when they met trouble, they didn't start pining after slavery, or when they met trouble, they didn't go back to acting like slaves, God commanded Joshua to circumcise the males. Now, what does circumcision have to do with getting rid of post-traumatic stress? In fact, wouldn't that stress some people out? I'm just saying. In fact, you want to cause some trauma? Circumcise some 10, 20, 30, and 40-year-olds. Yeah, you want to cause some trauma? But you see, just like with post-traumatic stress disorder, you have some therapy, right? You, you have, uh, 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 what is it called? Um, exposure therapy. And another is movement, uh, eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing, also known as EMDR. While these are used in delivering victims from post-traumatic stress disorder, and while EMDR works, they say, really good, God had his own therapy for post-traumatic slave syndrome. It wasn't EMDR. It was C-I-R-C, U-M. C-I-S-I-O-N. Now let me pause in the sermon to tell you this is not about trying to get everybody to get circumcised. <laughs> don't, don't leave here with that. Don't leave here with that. But it's about the symbolism of circumcision. God chose circumcision for Israel as a therapy of sorts for post-traumatic slave syndrome. And I believe God chose circumcision for three reasons. Circumcision commemorated the past. Circumcision celebrated the present. And circumcision ensured the future. I would love to spend time on all three, but we only have time for one. The third one. Circumcision ensured the future. Let me pause again. Make it very clear this sermon is not about everybody getting circumcised. The sermon is about circumcision because of what it symbolized for Israel. And so we as blacks and Christians can learn from Israel's story. So back to circumcision. Circumcision is a surgery. It is a cutting away of the flesh. In other words, circumcision is painful. As the young people and young adults of Israel were about to go into Canaan, they needed to understand nothing comes easy. When you make progress, when you go forward, really, and have true success, there's going to be pain. There's going to be struggle. And they needed to understand that. And so I believe God did that right at that time to help them to know this is what you need to understand. There will be pain and there will be struggle. We know that in black history, don't we? Harriet Tubman called the black Moses knew about that pain and struggle. In fact, last week in children's church, I asked the children about Harriet Tubman and they knew a whole lot. One child in particular, Jada McCleary, said Harriet Tubman was a woman who escaped slavery but who decided that it wasn't enough for her to escape slavery. She wanted to help others escape slavery as well. Out of the mouth of babes. 
Indeed, Harriet Tubman risked her life many, many, many times to free a total of over 300 slaves. True sacrifice is painful. It's a struggle, but it ensures a positive future for coming generations. What will you sacrifice for coming generations? Megar Evers, who was a civil rights activist before Martin Luther King Jr., knew about that pain, that struggle. He helped organize boycotts and sit-ins and voter registration and school integration in Mississippi. People who did not like his mission bombed his house, tried to run over him with a car, and ultimately assassinated him. True sacrifice is painful. It's a struggle but it ensures a positive future for coming generations. As a footnote, I should add that Megar Evers was assassinated in 1963, but his killer was not convicted of the crime until 1994. Well, that's incredible and shameful. What is miraculous and wonderful is that when his body was exhumed to, to get the killer, when his body was exhumed, when his body was taken out of the grave 28 years later, he looked just like he was when he went into the ground. God has a way of serving justice. I had to go look it up. Looked it up, and it's the truth. His body looked 28 years, at, after 28 years, his body looked the same as it did when he was buried. This struggle is a struggle. This struggle is a pain, but God will take care of you. Even in death, God will take care of you. David said, I've never seen, I I was young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor their seed begging bread. I was young and I was African American, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor their seed begging bread. God is able to take us through those painful moments. Carol Dolly Raphael, who is my mother, and a civil rights leader in her own right, grew up knowing about that pain and that struggle. She stood up for rights and the rights of others in Sac, her rights and the rights of others in Sacramento, Los Angeles, and California. I mean, Lodi and Lodi in California. She wrote several black history plays, and some, one of the stars was Michael Bruce Kelly Sr. She did her best to warn the black church, I'm sorry, the black leaders in Southern California that the city of Linwood was going to take Linwood Academy by eminent domain. At that time, the school was now a predominantly black school. It was okay to be in Linwood when it wasn't. But now that you got a predominantly black student body, let's take it by eminent domain. She founded a mobile black history museum, which has been showcased in Rubytown, and has been taken on the road throughout Northern California and even in Detroit, Michigan. The Clavons know. As others here in her generation, she has endured racism even in the church like many of you, even in the church, but has remained a faithful and fighting member. Will she please wave her hand? My mom's in the back. Can we just put our hands together for her? True sacrifice is painful, it's a struggle, but it ensures a positive future for coming generations. What will you sacrifice for the next generation? Finally, when Beyonce and her dancers performed at the Super Bowl, dressed in black leather, black berets, we can go to the next picture, and sporting natural hair, It gave us a re-envision of the Black Panther or a throwback to the Black Panther Party. The Black Panther Party was a black organization that stood for black rights first in Oakland, California, and later throughout the United States. 
According to my mother, my father was at the very least a sympathist of the party. And while people have their mixed or very clear feelings about what the Black Panther Party represented or represents, Beyonce's choice to to represent at the Super Bowl has been criticized and ridiculed. And while I have listened thoroughly to her song formation, (laughs) from Missouri, And while I watched her video several times, and while my Christian sensibilities were offended, to say the least, I heard Jesus whispering in my ear, if you don't speak up, the rocks will cry out. If you don't speak up, the rock stars will speak up. Discounted and discredited if you like. Uh Talk about how she's dressed and how they move if you want to. But what have you done lately? What have I done lately? It is us who are supposed to liberate the oppressed according to Luke chapter 4. Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he's anointed me, and he talks later to liberate the oppressed. That's the job of the church. It's not the job of the world. That's the job of you and me. It's not the job of Beyonce. It's not the job of the Black Panthers. It's the job of Jesus' church to do this. And I can talk about them if I want to. I can put them down if I like. The reality is we all have a responsibility. Now, she's lost some money behind that. She's lost some popularity behind that. What will you sacrifice for the next generation? For Christians to liberate the oppressed, we must make a true sacrifice. Though it is painful and though it make, and though it is a struggle. Why? Because it ensures a positive future for coming generations. What will you sacrifice for the next generation? Circumcision ensured the Israelites' future, though it would have seemed to make them vulnerable and endanger them. With this act of obedience, with this act of sacrifice, they were beginning to give, to give later generations an opportunity to enjoy things that they did not get a chance to enjoy. Circumcision was a painful procedure, especially for young men and older men. But they looked into the future and they saw what it would mean to the next generation. They looked into the future and they they saw what it would mean to their descendants. So I say to you, endure the pain to to ensure a promising future for coming generations. What pain? Endure the pain of going to school or going back to school so you can begin a career that will truly support you and your family. Pain, what pain? Endure the pain of getting out of debt or the pain of building that business so you can leave an inheritance for your children and your family and others. It's painful. What pain? Endure the pain of changing your eating habits so you can live healthier for those you love and for others around you that you're trying to help. Pain, what pain? Endure the pain of the criticism that you will get when you choose to start doing something that will help black people. Can I say that one again? Endure the pain of the criticism you will get when you choose to start doing something that will help black people. May I digress? My son Mark sent me this from his Facebook page. It reads, notice that there is more pressure on black people. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Manus. Notice that there is more pressure on black people to stop talking about racism than there is for racists to stop being racist. System doesn't want racism to end. It just wants you to stop talking about it. I will add, 
The devil don't care how much you talk about it. Talk all you want. Just don't do nothing about it. And when you do something about it, believe there's going to be heat, there's going to be criticism. There's going to be misunderstanding of what you're trying to do. When you're trying to help all God's people, someone say amen. Now we will end with an even more sensitive subject. To treat Israel's post-traumatic slave syndrome, I believe God not only chose circumcision to ensure they understood that going forward there is no progress without pain, but I also believe God chose circumcision to ensure that they put their future before their hormones. As you might imagine, circumcision means celibacy for a period of time. The men got that. In other words, God was asking the men of the camp, the men of the community, to refrain from a natural desire so that the stage could be set for a supernatural victory. Through circumcision, God was ensuring and asking the men of the camp, the men of the community, to refrain from a natural desire so that the stage could be set for a supernatural victory. They were about to walk around a fortified city and the walls were about to come down. Without a rock, without a battering ram, without rope, They were about to experience a supernatural victory. So God said, guess what? If you're going to have this kind of victory, you're going to have to put your hormones on hold so that you can have a better future. Now, we're we're just about ready to end. But can we just unpack this a little bit? If the men were choosing to be celibate, for a certain period of time. Then the women were also being celibate for a certain period of time. So by getting the males in line, God was getting the community in line for a blessing that would extend through the generations. I could say so much more about this, but I will simply encourage you to get and read The Weight by Devon Franklin and Megan Good. I've started reading it. It's a great book already. And get and read The Wedding Cake by our own Cheryl J. Jones. She has written an awesome book about it as well. Men, black men. Women, black women. Put your future and the future of coming generations before your hormones. Some of us can say that because we didn't. And there are consequences to everything we do that's not in line with the Word of God. And Israel was going to go through consequences if they they were not going to follow what God said. God had established circumcision with Abraham almost 500 years before. And now he's reinstituting it with these young people, these young adults who are about to go in and experience supernatural things. Finally, I believe God used circumcision So the men of the community would know and pass down that someday God would come as a man and would not only experience circumcision, but would experience something far more painful and far more enduring, the crucifixion. Jesus would commemorate the past. Jesus would celebrate the present. And most of all, Jesus would endure the pains and the struggles of life. Jesus would put the future before his hormones and even before his desire to live. Can you see these scriptures? He says, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. That's Isaiah 53, 11. And he went a little further and fell on his face. This is Matthew 26, 39, and prayed saying, oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Matthew 26, 39. Jesus didn't want to die. Jesus didn't want to have to struggle and suffer, but he did it for you and me and generations into eternity. He says, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, 
looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Circumcision will leave a scar. The crucifixion will leave a scar. And even though Jesus was glorified, the scars still remain. He told Thomas, put your fingers in my scars. Why is it so painful? Because true sacrifice is painful. It's a struggle. But the scars of Christ ensure the positive future of generations without end. At this time, I have a little illustration I'm going to give you for our appeal. They're going to be bringing a table out. Hint, hint. Michelle Ellis and Michael Main are going to help us with this. When I was a child in church, our musicians come forward. When I was a child in church, I, I heard an illustration given by a preacher. I want to adapt it for this, for this sermon. There was a city called Hope and a city called Despair. The city called Hope had people in it who were happy and healthy, and the city called Despair had people who were sad and starving. The people in the city called Despair had dinner tables full of food, but they couldn't eat because their eating utensils were too long. Their food, as they tried to scoop it up, would never get quite to their mouth. And so you might imagine why the city of despair was sad and starving. The people in the city called Hope had dinner tables full of food too. And they also had eating utensils that were too long. But they were happy and healthy because each person knew that their utensil was not to feed themselves but to feed the person across the table. (laughs) Do you get the illustration? This, these represent our sacrifice. We can talk about the struggle all we want to. We can get mad. We can blow it all up on Facebook if we want to. We can write about it, journal about it. But until we sacrifice, for ourselves so that someone else can have, we haven't done anything. But burden some paper and burden somebody's ears. We have to sacrifice. It's painful, it's a struggle, but it will help future and coming generations. What will you sacrifice? What will you give up? Will it be money? Will it be your influence? What will you give for the cause? Not just of the kingdom that will come 
in the sweet by and by, but for the kingdom that Jesus talks about on earth. Our heavenly Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth or in earth as it is in heaven. God expects us to do something, but it's going to take sacrifice. We have to think and we have to pray for it because only God can roll back the reproach, the shame of what we've experienced. 